guys how you doing today <clears throat> uh, it's like to be here so first things first let's talk about a few things I have a new chorus out on true fire Woo! well through true fire if you want to get it, it's called uptown blues take five uptown blues and it is available through my website or the link here and it's 25% off if you order it through my website please order it through my website if you want to get it and what the course is about is something we talk about quite a bit here in um, the Brooklyn broadcast or the Brooklyn lockdown or whatever you want to call it at this point. Um, <clears throat> and that is uh, adding some more stuff into your playing. So the first thing I wanted to do, and I'm, this is a, a, something similar to the course, but not an exact example, but one of the things that we come across in the course. And that is uh, adding in some other chords to a blues to make it a little bit more exciting. So the course focuses in a lot of one, six, two, five, ones going on, which is really important uh, to become a, a solid blues guitar player is to get your one, six, two, five, one chord progressions together. But today uh, I want to talk about um, the adding in a diminished seventh arpeggio and a diminished seventh chord in a blues. And this is like one of our first places where we can come across um, adding in something that may or may not be in the chord progression. All right, so let's talk about it. So the first thing we have, my changes right here is one, one dominant seven, right? I go to my four chord. 
And I'm going to go to a sharp four diminished seven. So I'm going by C, my, I'm in a G of blues, so my four chord is C7 or C9. And I'm going to play C sharp diminished seventh. And what is really cool is it, the diminished seventh chord, note wise, or the way you spell it out, is root flat three, flat five, and double flat seven. So a C sharp diminished seventh chord is going to be C sharp, E, G flat. B double flat. I should, sorry, I should say, should, yeah, no, no, that's right, no, B flat. Being an idiot there. So, interestingly enough, it's a C7 chord, C, E, G, B flat with a sharp root. So it's C sharp, E, G, B flat. So it's really common, so you just kind of listen to that sound. We have 165, we'll talk about that in a sec. Right? So, um, <coughs> excuse me, guys. C7, C9, C sharp diminished seventh. We're going to put that on bar five of a blues. Now, what's hip is we don't have to have that chord there. So check it out. I'm just going to solo over regular one, bar, one, four, five blues, and I'm going to show you the little lick, and then but I want you to hear it first. So. My four chord, right? Then. Right, so one again. I messed that down. <laughs> That's live, okay. Right? Okay, so here is the lick, guys. Here is the fingering that is the big... I. At the intro, I overplayed it. Played it pretty much every single time. So let's take a look at this little lick. There's the big fingering. So let's check it out. Um, the notes of C sharp diminished seventh, once again, are C sharp, E, G, and B flat. And we're going to start on our B flat, starting on our flat seventh or double flat seven. B flat. There's my E flat. Sorry. One more time. B flat, there's my C sharp. Sorry, guys. E, G, and B flat. So. That kind of, it's a, it's a fingering that falls really easily on the guitar. So I have, I can finger it a number of ways. One, four, three, one, four. Or I can do one, this is what Ingve does. One, three, two, one, four. So. So he gets this. That's if you want to play it fast and all that. But that fingering, it's actually kind of cool because it, it allows you to play it pretty quickly, which he does. So here, there's a phrase. So I'm going to go from C7. hear that change? So I went from a C7 arpeggio, or just the notes of C7, or even does a C, like a G blues lick. Right, so I'm superimposing it whether it's there or it's not. So let's hear it again. I'm going to be really deliberate on this. I'll get to the new guitar in a minute. So the one... Here's my four chord coming up. Here's my four, right? I can just play the diminished seventh of arpeggio, watch. All right? So let's come around again. Here's my 165 one. Let's 
So I'm going to get that diminished seventh arpeggio again. Watch. Okay, so I played that diminished seventh arpeggio, and then I resolved it to my G chord. So here we go. So the first thing you want to do is take this track, which I'm sorry, I will post uh, when I get off. I've been, been super busy, guys. I even posted late on what I was going to be talking about today. So a uh, little behind, a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, all good, but um, trying to keep up. And I think I need a vacation. <laughs> all right, so sharp four diminished seven, it comes on bar five of a blues. So the first thing you want to just do is to just, every time that goes by, Right? You see how we resolve that? Here's my diminished seventh arpeggio, B flat, C sharp, E, uh, G, here's my B flat. Right? Because the B natural on my G7 chord. So you really get this great push towards it, right? You get... So let's take a look at that. All right, so diminished seventh fingering is going to be this. That's our first one. But let's actually let's back off for one second. The interesting thing about the diminished seventh chord is each of the notes are equidistant apart. Everything is a minor third separation. So we get this cool. So the chord, any of these notes, can technically be the root because everything is just a minor third apart. So what we want to think about is, well, what can I do here about this? Well, if any of the notes is the root, generally speaking, you're going to refer to the root as the one in the bass, or sometimes the one on the top. But very often, if you're thinking like rhythm guitar, it's the one in the bass note. So check this out. That same chord can move exactly in minor thirds. So our notes, once again, are going to be C sharp, uh, E, G, and B flat. So I'm going to move up. There's my E. There's my B flat. There's my C sharp. And there's my G. Move it up to the G in the bass. There's my G. There's my C sharp. There's my E. There's my B flat. Put the B flat in the bass. B flat. And there is my E. There's my G. And there's my C sharp. So it's all the same chord. And you've probably heard that. That's that, like tied to the train tracks, you know. And it. It wants to resolve, right? It really pushes you because you've got this leading tone in there. It wants to hear that. Right? Now here's a diminished chord. There's my G. Now, if we look at another C-sharp diminished seventh voicing, there's this, and we have this. That's another really important fingering. So we have, there's my E, B-flat, C-sharp, and G. And this moves up. Right? I've heard that a million times. And you can put that in, so I'm going to just do that. Check it out. One, da, one.
Okay, now, if the chord is movable, then your diminished seventh chord lick is movable. So that's that fingering I was talking about earlier. That's great. Let's hear that. Okay. All right, now my four chord. Right? So there's that lick. So there's a bunch of ways I can play that. Just up. And that's where that other fingering works nicely. And there's all sorts of variations. Up and down like that. That's the kind of that Ingve sort of thing you hear all the time from him. Yeah. It'll work. Not the right guitar for that. <laughs> that kind of sound, so it's really just pulling you forward. My six, two. So the first way I would start to think about using this in, in a real active way is uh, what I did in the beginning of the song. I overuse it. Every time you come across a sh where the sharp four diminished seventh chord would be, bar five of your blues, play that arpeggio. Like just... So you know where it is, you're, you can target it, you can telegraph it ahead of time, you know where it's coming, you know where it's going to resolve, and then practice getting the resolution right to the G chord, right? So all those are going to pull. So if we take a look, if you saw that one, that's pretty. Or I could do, all right, there's my D, so I can go up, that's pretty because I'm hitting a chord tone. Or how about I go back to the root. So a lot of these will resolve uh, within the chord, or um, they're gonna do that leading tone from the B flat to the one, to the, sorry, B flat to the three. So flat three to the three. All right, now, uh, this isn't a diminished scale. And I have a whole course at True Fire on the diminished scale. And I'll talk about in one of the upcoming lockdowns about the diminished scale. This isn't diminished scale. This is the diminished arpeggio. And of course, the diminished arpeggio is contained in a diminished scale. But diminished scale theory is much deeper. And so the question is, how does C sharp diminished seven fo you know, focus or function? And it's this tritone that's in there. So we've got this. We have this tritone right here, which is E flat, and sorry, E and B flat, which is part of my C chord. It's just like a regular blues, right? So all we're doing by putting in that sharp root is adding some more tension to the chord to make it resolve more. So listen a bit, listen. Or Yeah, one more time. <laughs> or, and we get that. All right, so it just adds a little bit more pull, a little more interest in the in the solo. Now, uh, from a soloing point, it it kind of exists in, if we're mixing major and minor pentatonic scale, which we do all the time on a blues ring. So I have G major pentatonic, and I have G minor blues. So this diminished seventh arpeggio is actually contained when we start to look at all of them, or it's like a, a G minor blues scale. It's in the G minor blues scale. We're going to add in the six, which is from the major blues scale, or it's just a note we know we can use. Right? Okay, so okay, oh, I messed that up. Now here's a cool fingering for this. We have this pattern, 
which is kind of the number one. I would get into that first because it's the easiest to play. It's a symmetrical pattern that works on the guitar fairly easily. Not super easy, but fairly easily. And the other one is kind of cool if we just say if we did this. So. That one's a little tricky to get down. So I'm just doing one, four, and then I go up a tritone to B flat and C sharp. And I'll explain why I call it B flat and C sharp in a minute. Then E to G, B flat, C sharp, E flat, E to G. So it's just this kind of, it just moves up one fret each time, except of course when you do the change of this tuning. We get all cool patterns out of that. Yeah, it's been a while since I played that one. All right, hey, it's live. But some of those kind of patterns you can get those that sound there. So, yeah. There's my G there. We find those Gs that it's going to resolve to. So. So C sharp diminished seven, G seven. C sharp diminished seven, G seven. C sharp diminished seven, G seven or G major. So you start to find all those. It's much easier to play those licks. All right. So there's C sharp diminished seven, or or G diminished seven, or B flat diminished seven, or E diminished seven to the G seven. The other one, C sharp, and then, All right? So if you see where those exist, you can actually start using them fairly easily. Makes sense? Um, all right, so once again, just use the arpeggio in the one position here. And then you could put the you can start putting that into your playing. And it's really largely you can see it based upon the blues scale or something like that as well. All right. Uh, any questions on this? So I'll just start jumping ahead uh, on a few things. Okay, what is the guitar? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, the guitar is, you know, I got it a few years ago. It's a JJ guitars. Um, and I met the guy's name is Jeff Guilford, and I met him at NAM, and we hit it off. And uh, he sent me this to, to play and check out, and it's a pretty unique guitar. It's made out of like a hundred-year-old mahogany. It's pretty cool. Um, I I I hadn't been playing it that much. I'm just kind of messing back with it again. It's really it's pretty great. Um, two pickups. He's got this interesting six-way switch. So, you know, you get these different sounds, but none of, them, none of them make noise, so it's interesting, but I always end up using it on the down switch. Oh, on my record, that tune Marta that I wrote. Uh, that one. Yeah. It's been a while since I played it. Was actually written and performed on this guitar, interestingly enough. So there you go. Um, <coughs> excuse me. All right. So one other thing about diminished, as you get a little deeper into it, you're gonna hear it a lot in classical music, especially in the Baroque period. And it borrows from harmonic minor, uh, which we'll get into. I'm gonna do a whole thing in harmonic minor coming up. But this lick. You hear the Ingve do that, like, yeah, just messing it up. That kind of sound. So get that under your fingers, um, and then for the next upcoming harmonic minor stuff. Okay, so let's see. If we have some some questions. Oh, new course, Uptown Blues, available on my website or that link that Phil has given us so much. Hey, Phil, Phil's back. And uh, 30, sorry, 25% off if you enter live 25. Um, 
I like all of my courses. I, I like this one a lot because I got to talk about playing through chord changes in a blues like a 1, 6, 2, 5, 1, a sharp 4 diminished 7th chord, adding in a dominant 7th flat 7, adding in a sharp, uh, adding in a 4 minor chord, ways to spice up blues tunes, uh, and ways to navigate those chord progressions. And one thing we come across, which is really interesting, um, is if we, if you guys are here all the time, I talk about playing over chord changes and seeing the chord. What's important is to play over as many as you can and then realize that stylistically, sometimes that's not the greatest idea. So you want to think about how you can go in and out of doing both. So just like with a sharp four, this sharp four diminished seventh arpeggio, when you practice it, you want to practice it, practice the heck out of it. You know, like really just keep on doing it. But um, when you're performing, don't do it every time because then it becomes... Uh, really predictable. But if you throw it in here and there, it's one of those things like, oh, wow, that's, that's really hip. That's, that person knows what they're doing on the instrument. And as an average listener, if you're hearing pentatonic all night, like... Right. Suddenly it's like, whoa, what was that? You know, this little thing jumps out and then it really brightens up. Uh, or adds more interest, peaks my ear. All right, so let's say hi to everybody who is here. Um, all right, well, Phil, of course. Thanks, Phil. Everybody, I think. Uh, Bro, so what's up? S.C. Nesbitt, Bob Wright, Phil Spruce, Kelly, uh, Alchemist, Graham, Tom, Matt Gibson, what's up? Everybody. Uh, Richard, Chad, everyone, thanks for being here. Uh, Keith's 5 Watt World. Hey, what's up, man? Um, okay. So, Jerry McGill, what's up? All right, everyone. Beavy's here. Hey, man. What's going on? Bob Wright. All right. Okay, so let's see some questions, if we have any. All right, what are the notes in the arpeggio? Okay, well, one thing about a diminished seventh arpeggio uh, that you want to think about, that's... that's um, that you want to, that, that's interesting. Since it's root flat three, flat five, double flat seven, we use what's, con, we can call what's, you, we use what's called an enharmonic spelling. And what that means is um, technically, let's say we're going to do C diminished seventh, all right? So it's root flat three, flat five, double flat seven. So C major, C, E, G, B, C major seven. So if I'm going to flat my 7, that's going to give me C7, C, E, G, B flat. I'm going to flat my 3rd, that gives me C, E, flat, G, B flat, which is C minor 7. If I flat my 5, I get C, E flat, G flat, B flat, which is C minor 7 flat 5. So there's my B flat, but if I double flat my 7, well, my, my flat 7 is B flat. If I double flat it, it becomes... B double flat, also known as A. But uh, technically, like up at, you know, it's in college, if I called it an A, it would be technically wrong because it's a B double flat. Nobody, nobody's going to ride you for something like that because, you know, it's A. See, but um, technically speaking, from a pedagogical standpoint, it is a B double flat. All right, so I'm just kind of showing off what I paid all that stupid money for. <laughs> Uh, but that's a cool exercise, guys. See what notes move inside. So you're starting to see root three fives and flat sevens, root three five sevens inside your chord shape, so the chord shape isn't just a chord shape anymore. Oh, a sweep picking lesson. But um, eventually, but let me show you. This. Thanks, uh, S.E., for, for bringing that up. So one way to pick that, and that's, thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to bring that up, and I forgot. So cool. Yeah. All right, so what I'm doing there, hammer on, pick, 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 pull off, up, pick, up, pick, pull off. So I've got... So down, hammer, down, hammer. No, so down, hammer, down, down, up, pick, pull off. Up pick, up pick, down pick. So I end up sweeping it. Yep. 
interesting enough, one of the the thing that I I, um, I spoke to Jeff who made this guitar, we're going to put a pick guard on it. I find the only thing I find a little tricky as I'm discovering now, uh, again, is the height. It's like a junior where it kind of sits a little high off the body. I'm so used to putting my hands on uh, the, the pick guard. In other words, I can't play a Les Paul unless it's got a pick guard because of the way I've developed my picking. So these faster things sometimes become a little weird because my hand falls underneath. Because, you know, the, the, the angle changes a little bit. Okay, so this is that. If you get that, that's a great way to start into sweet picking. And what you get is, you can see it starts to fall under your fingers. And that's what anybody does. All right, so I can do that for hours. And All right. Um, it says, true, true, Live 25 discount work just once. True Fire says it can't be used on this course because I've just used it before. Because you... Um, it's not supposed to be the case. It's supposed to be for anything through my website with that code. So let me let me contact them. Uh, all right, <laughs> these things happen. They're great people. Uh, lots going on everywhere. So it's a lot of work to get all these things. But okay, I'll definitely check it out with them. So thanks, man. I'll, I'll take a look into that. Um, Lick from Someday Baby. Um, yeah, it's the same kind of idea. I, I used it in 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 that. True Fire course, uh, when I did, uh, you know, I, and I did it here. It's definitely something you can use on any diminished seventh chord. Okay. Um, yes, uh, the chords are movable, right? As, um, as Bob Wright was saying, yeah, the voicings are movable. And I, if you're going to be like every guitar player on the planet, like myself, sometimes you try to do it and you miss it. Crap, you know. So you got to practice it. It's easy to short it, right? There's a, a song on my first record called uh, Guanus 5 0, where it goes, uh, uh, then I do, uh, goes to the, then, yeah, uh, then, oh no, it starts in B, A flat. So I'll just show you my lick again. Goes in here, then. A flat, and then the spy chord. Then I do again. Then we go. That's how that tune goes. I throw it in that. It's called Guanas 5 for my first record, which is available on IMA and on um, Bandcamp. All right. What were the notes for the arpeggio again? Uh, root, flat three, flat five, double flat seven. In this particular case, C, E, G, B flat. C sharp, C sharp. See, they're in there too. So they're all over the place. All right. Um, no more questions. Okay. So, what do you guys want to talk about? <laughs> All right, so with this, let me just talk about that. This diminished seventh chord, you can move it downwards too. I just moved it up, right? So I went, you know, I can also do, it sounds great if I do, you know, my G chord. Right? That sounds great when you bring it down. I messed that up. You see, I messed it up. So bring it down the scale is, is just equally as uh, equally as good sounding. All right. So um, I'm, Jeff seems to 
see the board like the matrix. <laughs> That's pretty funny. I wish you're saying I, I see the fingerboard like the matrix. I, I don't as much as I would like to. Um, I know when, you know, being around playing with Robin, he sees it like that in my mind. It's just always, he never kind of, it just explodes that way for him. But this is one of those ones is I, I still have to sometimes think about this diminished movement because as you saw, I messed it up. Um, and that comes from just not playing it enough. That's really the key. Okay, now, say like a classical sort of situation. We'll talk about that for a minute. So if we're playing, you know. Like that kind of, you hear that Bach. Uh, Paganini, all those things. And the diminished seventh chord exists in a, in a two chords, a melodic minor and harmonic minor. But if you want to play a minor chord, you can play the diminished seventh chord down a half step. Right? You hear that? So like... Hear that sound right there? I just went. So C sharp diminished seven, same one, but to B minor this time. To D minor, excuse me. That's where you hear like someone like Ingve Malmsteen use it that way quite a bit. Um, so I would look into. Yeah, sorry guys, look at my messages for Phil. Um, okay, so. C sharp diminished seven to the D minor. Or so playing C sharp diminished seven. Or I can resolve it to major if I want to. But that's that sound that pulls you there. We can talk more about that stuff, which is a bit of my older playing. Hold on. Um, let, me, let me get it to where I can. There we go. Um, so. There we go. <laughs> sort of. So moving on to that, a little easier on this guitar because of the, the pick guard height. That's where it's coming in. So for the diminished stuff, it's caught in fugue in D minor. Right? Then he goes, you know, we heard this. Yeah, just keep that mess it up. Then that to major. But that's that sound. Um, and in blues, it's going to be, it functions differently than it would in something like harmonic minor. But um, you'd like to hear some of that old playing. Oh, I still love playing the shreddy stuff. Um, but uh, it's been a little bit where I can, what was I working on the other day? Uh. Then somebody, English, English, English. yeah. I'm not warmed up, and it's, this isn't the guitar for it, but um, I promise I'll do something on a little bit more shreddy stuff 
later. Uh, when I say it's not the guitar for it, that's something to think about really seriously, guys. I've got tens, nine and a half radi uh, 12 inch, sorry, seven and a quarter radius. Uh, guys like Ingve, he's got like about a nine radius. He flattens the fingerboard out. So in terms of playing faster uh, on a vintage guitar isn't always the easiest thing in the world. But that sounds like an excuse, but it's, it's a real one. <laughs> it's a real excuse. Okay. Um, what's the voicing on the C sharp diminished seventh? Uh, I've run over that. Uh, it's, it's this again. So it's, if you just take, you know, a C seventh chord, you sharp your root. There's your voicing right there. And you move it up in minor thirds. Same thing here. What I love is I can end it to, to the G, or I could do... Now I'm keeping hearing it now as minor since we were playing that way before. That whole thing. Um, so the half diminished, this is from Keith, if I what world. So the half diminished there is leading into the Dorian over that D minor. Um, well, the half diminished chord um, is, we call it also minor seven flat five, it's this one. Uh, so in the key. So say for in the key of D minor, well, uh, D Dorian, it's going to be B minor, B minor seven flat five. Because in, yeah, that's going to go down a whole theoretical <laughs> rabbit hole. <laughs> um, so I, I look at it as the D minor seven, I'm sorry, uh, C sharp diminished seven. Just look at his own thing. Minor seven flat five is actually... I see it as kind of a different chord. Um, when improvising and you want to add a diminished seventh chord or riff before the chord change, uh, I think uh, of one way is to use as a flat. I don't, that's not a complete sentence as far as I can tell. Um, all right, improvising, while improvising, you want to add a diminished seventh chord or riff right before chord change. I think of the one to use it is flat. Um, on a blues, in a blues, I'm just using it as a sharp four diminished seventh chord. That's where it sits best. Um, on a harmonic minor thing, the chord has to match what I'm going to play, and it's a half step below the root of the minor chord. Okay. So, um, so no, five watt world. Sorry, man. I, yeah, that's going to go into a whole theoretical. I, I can't. For me, I'm always the kind of guy that's kind of like, yeah, you can just use it here. I need to get into the whole reason why diminished is different than half diminished and, and all that. <laughs> okay. Um, Mike Anderson that called that sweet picking and it is hard to learn. Is it hard to learn? Yeah, everything's hard to learn, but you got to practice it. It, um, it should be totally something you can master, right? Just by kind of playing over it. It's got to work through it. Yeah. That's all one, five, one, five, one, and then like that kind of sound. Uh, so this is taking me down a different road entirely, which I'm happy to go through. I think that would be a great other course of a full diminished uh, or a harmonic minor course uh, using those sounds uh, in a classical way. Because I use that stuff all the time. I love that sound, you know. Was like invention number four by Bach. Been a long 
times as I've played this stuff. So, but that sound, the Paganini stuff. That kind of stuff, you know, hearing diddle 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 diddle, right? So that's set. So I'm hearing just just playing A minor to E seven. Okay, so um, well, this stream shows how skilled you are. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, yeah, I love everything. I grew up listening to metal. Uh, I'm a huge classical music fan. I'm a huge jazz fan. Um, I'm pretty obsessively into um, uh, not, well, moment, momentarily. At the time, at, at now, I'm, I've been listening to a lot of John Dowland, which was the Renaissance composer. Uh, just amazing, and hear a lot of this harmony in that. Um, like I said, you know, Ingve Malmsteen was a, a game changer for me, and uh, absolutely love his guitar playing, especially the earlier stuff. Um, what is the earlier stuff? If you listen to him in like 1983 and 84, and when he first hit, there's just he was just the guy um, at the time, just crazy good. Uh, the tone, the vibrato, nobody, nobody plays like that. Like when you hear him, even to this day, you know, I mean, you think what you will about his music and a lot of people love it. I don't, I haven't followed his music because it, my tastes have changed, but I can still go back to that early stuff. And, um, you know, one of the reasons why I don't do a lot of that kind of stuff on the internet is there's guys who do it so much better than me. I'm influenced by it, but if you throw yourself into that arena, right? If I start going online, playing me hacking my way through Ingve and Shreddy stuff, at the level I can do it when guys who are friends of mine who can just completely kill that stuff and really, really just destroy it and play it so well. Um, you know, the internet, as I often have found recently, is full of people who were, uh, you know, they, they enjoy taking you down. So for me, I, I kind of lean out of that arena I do it at home, and I might add some of those kind of things and like that. But what I got from all this sort of things like that um, is this. The understanding, these are all arpeggios, guys. So if I can go through, I'm just going to play A minor to E minor. I play slow. I'm just thinking about A minor to E7, excuse me. So I get this. Yeah, here's my A minor. See what I just did there? I went up A minor, add a little chord scale tone, E7, yeah. harmonic minor, but that's that sound, so I just can practice going E, A minor, E, A minor, E. And you hear that resolution, right? It just takes you to it. That's Bach. That Paganini stuff, which I played a little earlier, you know. Um, played a lot faster. Then we did that. Then it gets really hard. Then going through all the arpeggios. Um, and written for violin. And there are guitar players who can do it. I'm maybe not <laughs> one of them. Um, Michael Schenker. Yeah, totally. I got a lot of that stuff from Schenker uh, as well. Um, 
he gets a lot of the that sound. Um, he's not as shreddy in that Ingve kind of sense. Um, but Schenker borrows from that. And the other guy that I learned a lot of this stuff, and I wish I could play all this stuff for you, which I'm, I can't because I'll get demonetized and all that, is a guy named Uli John Roth, who played with the Scorpions, and a particular song called Sales of Sharon off of the Taken by Force record, which is just totally crazy, crazy good. And then uh, Richie Blackmore, of course, too, with Three Purple and Rainbow. Uh, Long Live Rock and Roll record, Kill the King, Man of Silver Mountain, all these kind of sounds, you hear them in there. Um, okay, one of my favorite classical guitar players, you know, I, I, I don't know a lot about classical guitar players. Um, I'm, you know, Julian Bream, who just unfortunately just passed away, John Williams, um, I'm pretty limited in, in that aspect. I love listening to classical guitar. I don't have a particular favorite interpreter of the classical guitar stuff. Um, I love, uh, I played classical guitar. I did actually get accepted to college as a classical guitar player. And I'm really glad I never did that because it's, I'm totally not cut out for that. That's all, it's all practice. And I have the utmost respect for those guys, but just wanted to, to rock, you know, I couldn't do it. I'm glad I didn't do it. Um, Diminished seventh arpeggio in Jeff's memory. <laughs> um, yeah, the Rising Force record by Ingve. That's pretty amazing. Um, there's just no denying how great that record is. And the one that I really love too. There's a few of them. Uh, Live Sentence by Alcatraz. That was the album. That was a group before that with Graham Bonnet singing. And man, he's guitar playing on that is so good. There's all these videos from that period. Uh, where he's really young and just insanely good. And if you watch his right hand, it is the most effortless thing in the world. Now, do I put that on? I can listen to those records. There's a bit of nostalgia and there's a bit of like, I really still love it. But I, I, I can't necessarily make it to the whole record anymore. Um, and my thoughts on Ingve, uh I met him a few times, which were always so disappointing. <laughs> He was such a dick, <laughs> which I kind of laughed at. Well, first I met him when I was like 16 and he's, a, I guess like three or four years older than me. And he was my, you know, he came out at 16. I was in high school. It was amazing. I saw him backstage. I managed to get backstage and he just completely blew me off. Like everybody else is, you know, just wants to say hi to him. He's like, he kept on walking. Um, you know, but now after being in bands on the road, he probably had just woken up. So, you know, um, and then another time I saw him was backstage. He'd opened for ACDC and I knew someone. So we got backstage and it was the best thing in the world, man. He gets off the stage and he's in it. Get, he's in his stage clothes, right? He gets off stage, comes backstage, out of backstage in, in stage clothes. Like he wears all the time, 24 seven. It was the funniest thing. I'm like, oh, he's, and uh, you know, I was probably pretty, <laughs> and I said hi to him and he was, uh, uh, he wasn't interested and that's cool. But the thing is um, I've seen him at clinics and uh, my friend James Hogan and Terry Sarek and they had, he had done a clinic at the, one of the National Guitar Workshops and they still tell me these great stories where he's completely entertaining and he was totally cool to the fans and you know he appreciates it so and anybody who knocks him I, I you know of course the how can less be more more is more comment is super famous from him but but in terms of his vibrato you know that's where I learned all that kind of like you know <laughs> You know, the whole kind of sound is all him, you know. That really big vibrato and his tone is just spectacular at that point in time. So, and that's where you'd hear, just to bring it back to the top, that's that diminished lick. That's where I first learned it, actually. Let's see if I remember. Oh, oh what's that go? Uh, wait, wait, def yeah. Wait, does that like... Oh yeah, diminished, okay. Yeah. So F sharp diminished seventh arpeggio, F sharp minor arpeggio. I'm, I'm flumbling here, guys. Then it goes back up like that kind of thing. So I promise at some point I'll tighten some of this stuff up and we'll do a little lesson on it. But that's one of the things uh, where that diminished seventh arpeggio comes into play. And what's nice when you start to hear it um, you remember that sequence from Ingve, right? So let me just, yeah, there it is. 
Then. Yeah. So E minor arpeggio. Yeah. It's been a little while, guys. So, all right. Um, all right, so just back to the beginning. Uh, new course at Truefire that does not show any Yngwie licks, but I'm talking about playing over some chord changes. That's out now. If you guys want to check it out and pick it up, I'd really love uh, you... Um, Really love for you to pick it up. And if you get to my website, I see them. I see that money directly. It really helps me continue to do these sort of things. Um, and how to um, continue forward with this. Because I really love doing the live streams. And you guys have been super generous with the tip jar and everything like that. So thanks so much for that too. So let's grab a few more questions. How do you get Robin Ford producing your record? Um, I probably told this story a bunch. Uh, he and I met through True Fire. I produced, or co-produced, I should say, his first video for True Fire. Um, the guys at True Fire, Brad, the owner, had asked me, um, he had said, hey, we got, we got Robin Ford to come in. And this is when True Fire was on the edge of being as big as they are now. I've been there since sort of the start. And I said, oh, great. Are you going to, you got to let him do the same video he always does? And they were like, well, what do you mean? And what, what there was, um, Robin, you know, obviously knows what he's doing, but I, I felt like I, I wanted to ask him so many questions in the videos. And so the, Brad, the owner, said, okay, well, you're hired then. So we came up, Brad and I came up with a, uh, a whole list of questions for him, a course outline, everything like that, and uh, asking very specific questions since I knew he was playing really well. I was a big fan, of course. And uh, that's how we met, producing the course. And then he just, he was like, he at one point like did you come up with these questions i said yeah and he's like well these are really good questions and then we just kind of hit it off and became friends uh we stayed in loose contact and then um he had his guitar dojo uh that we we're doing we did a bunch of those at full moon resort and something had happened with one of the other instructors i think it was like john jorgensen had to do a tour or something so Robin called me up and said, hey, can you, can you do this? And I said, sure. And I, and I think I can bring a lot of people. And we, we ended up selling it out and it worked out really great. And then we just became good friends. And then one day he just called me up and was like, hey, man, let's do a record together. And there you go. So that's how it happened. Uh, I talked to him the other day and we talked pretty frequently because he's a good friend. And um, we discussed doing another record. So uh, when things kind of start... Um, getting better with the world hopefully you know we can uh, get together and do another record down in nashville um uh, my goal on that record is to make it just kind of a kick-ass two guitar player record and uh i don't know if he knows that yet but that's the plan <laughs> you know so that's how i met robin that's how i got him to produce my record um all right uh Yngwie's ego yeah well he's known for that you know, but the thing about him, you got to think about, like, you know, if you put it in the perspective and nothing, you know, there's ego. But, you know, when you're 19 or 18 and you're that good and then everyone makes that big a deal about you and then you're in the cover of guitar magazines and people are calling you God and you're the biggest thing since, you know, sliced bread. And in my mind, um, I know I get crap for this. For me, like in the, the, the realm of guitar players, it's like Clapton and Page. Well, it's Clapton. Hendrix and there's guys in between and there was like in my mind as much as I love Jeff Beck the next guy would be like Van Halen who really revolutionized everything and then um, for me of course I think people would put Steve I in there but for me it was Van Halen and then Ingve was the next guy who took the world totally by storm uh, where technique became this other level of things just like Eddie prior to him of course there's great guys in there like Randy Rhodes is a big influence on me, and Steve Vai, and Satran, all these guys who were more technical and great. But I felt like Ingve was the guy um, who really just jumped it to that point. And, you know, Phil's typing in Jeff Beck. I'm, Jeff Beck is probably my favorite all-time guitar player in terms of just, if, if somebody said, eh, you know, I want to sound like me, but if somebody said, you could be any guitar player, it would be him. He's just, the, in my mind, he's the best. But um, uh, I think with, with, with Beck, uh, he, 
um, it was different. Like I think with for for me, I'm talking about technique. You know, where so many people were like, "What is going on?" I think Beck was always like, "What is going on?" But it was almost more subtle. If you know what I'm getting at, like Beck would do something, and it's deceivingly difficult. Even just something simple, quotation marks, like you know, yeah, yeah. right, like that kind of thing, right? Um, so you know, everybody's got to bring in their own opinion. I'm talking about my opinions. Everybody got their own opinions. Yes, Eric Clapton. I mean, Eric, you know, Eric Johnson. Yes, of course. And Alan Hall. Just Haldworth, another guy. Turn the world around. I'm talking about rock, straight on rock guitar in my life. You know, Van Halen, and then uh, Ingve, who took the world completely, who changed everything post them. I would say, yeah. I mean, there's all sorts of guys, of course. You know. Like I, this is this is like they get into those crazy arguments. Like who's best? There's no best. Here we go. All right, I'm gonna name my favorite guitar players, all equally a freaking well, not equally freaking amazing because there's just the. All right, Jeff Beck, absolutely. Eric Johnson, huge influence on me and every other guitar player. That first video, especially right, that Total Electric guitar, I watched that thing a million times. So Eric Johnson for sure. Um, uh, you, I hope you love lists. Okay, here we go. Jeff Beck, uh, Eric Johnson, Randy Rhodes is big. Jakey Lee for the rock stuff. I think Warren D. Martini is absolutely spectacular when he was in Rat. Don't, can't really listen to his records, but man, what a guitar player. We're talking rock guys. Uh, Blackmore, Ingve, Van Halen. Um, you know, Clapton for sure. Still, I always listen to Clapton and go, this is this the coolest thing in the world. Um, you know, if there's more fusion guys like Haldsworth is... Holdsworth's from another planet. I mean, that, him lo losing him was such a drag. I mean, I just absolutely just, I mean, who's better than Alan Holdsworth, really, when you think about it? <laughs> I mean, harmonic content, like just un like from another planet. And I think if it, you know, I think the only guy I could think of was, was just from enough of a different planet, like that would have been Hendrix, right? Because I was wasn't around when Hendrix first came up, but a lot of my friends were, and they're like, no, if you listen to what was going on at the time, and then suddenly the first Hendrix record comes out, it's like this thing from another planet. Same thing with the Haldsworth records, like the uh, UK record that he did, and then, of course, IOU was a big one for me. There's all these, like, everybody can, everybody's throwing out their names. Yeah, everybody's got their own stuff. I mean, Dimiola was a big influence on me. Um, you know, John McLaughlin wasn't as big an influence on me. He was a little later when I got into him, but ridiculous. And you listen to John McLaughlin's a lot of his pentatonic stuff like that, you know, that, you know, that kind of Eric Johnson stuff. McLaughlin was doing some of that stuff too, so not to, certainly not to detract from Eric Johnson. Um, so, um, yeah, as, as Keith just said, you know, Holdsworth, another concept about the instrument altogether, just completely from another planet. It was like a horn player. His soul was like a horn player. And then the chord stuff. And then, you know, it's funny. Um, uh, I was, I'm friends with, with Jimmy Haslip through Robin because we did some touring and Jim is such a nice guy. And, you know, God, he's played on all, some of my favorite records and he um, played with Hallsworth for a long time. And I just, how did you, how'd you learn those songs, man? Like, how would you remember those Hallsworth tunes all the time? He's like, uh, you just play them enough, you get used to it. It's kind of just a lot of us just improvising. And I'm like, all right, I don't get that at all. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know? So uh, I don't know where that went. Uh, how you could do that. John Schofield, just freaking amazing. Um, do I like Frank Gambale? Uh He's spectacular. It, it never spoke to me. Um, but, I mean, talk about, in terms of technique, like, oh, my God. I mean... In terms of Frank watching him play, we've met and hung out, super nice guy. And just when he plays, you're like, is, is anything difficult for you to play? You can play over anything. Absolutely spectacular guitar player. Um, so, you know. Um, uh, you know, so there's, yeah, all these guys, we all have the guys we love. And that's why these these list things are so crazy. Everybody's going to argue. Um People always ask, and then people like, you know, what do you think of like Rory Gallagher and Mike Bloomfield? I like Rory Gallagher. I like M Mike Bloomfield. They, they just never, I think a lot of it's when it hits you, right? Like when you first hear it, you know, when you first hear, when I first heard Ingve, I was in high school and I had his demo tape that he sent to, um, that's where I first heard him on a college radio station, WSOU in New Jersey, Seton Hall University had a metal show. 
and I listened to it obsessively and he would play his tape and you can get, you can get it on YouTube and he's got to be like 18 or 17. You know, I was like 15 at the time and it was just pulling off of the guys I loved like Schenker and Blackmore and, um, Lee John Roth, but you know, with Al Demiola's technique and, and sort of with his own thing and with that tone and the vibrato and all those things like that, you know, just completely, um, off the charts. Now, all right, people throwing out other names. I'll comment. Dwayne Allman, of course, you know, great. Uh, Tom Minnett, John McLaughlin, completely the best guitar player on earth. <laughs> um, uh, you know, yeah, those, that, that yeah, I think he's amazing. I love John McLaughlin. Um, and I love him with Miles, you know, some of that stuff. And of course, um, uh, Mahavishnu, Peter Green, of course. Now, I came to Peter Green later in my life um, through a student many years ago. I, he was not very popular in the States, right? We I mean, clapped and sure, but not Peter Green. Then he brought in, I think it was, um, yeah, it was If You Be My Baby. And I was like, this is really good. Who, this is Fleetwood Mac. I have no idea. And then it, that was it. I went overboard. Um, and who else? Uh, Paco De La Chia, that Yeah, that, that trio record whew, with Demiola and uh, McLaughlin and De La Chia, That was amazing. Um, okay, hey, Nikki, what's up? Nikki's got you got. Congratulations on getting a record deal. Nikki O'Neill is here. Fantastic. Well-deserved. Nikki's saying, okay, Carlos Santana Prince, probably not my cup of tea, but uh, given that people... No, I... I okay. Um, people love Carlos Santana. I, I'm... I'm a, uh, he's not one of the guys I love. I, I think he has in, in Woodstock. He was spectacular. Um, the vibe is I, I dig the vibe, um, but he's not a guy I really got into. Prince, um, just Prince is spectacular. Uh, I never really. <laughs> so people like, don't you, you must love Prince? I'm like, yeah. I I see the genius, and I've got friends who've played me all sorts of stuff. Absolutely ridiculous, and that was what a loss losing that guy. You know, for those stupid talking reasons like drugs and, and and all that stuff um but musically like i get it it just never really it never got me where i became head over heels over the guy but i get it for sure you know um ruby cannon oh yeah ruby cannon sure oof there was a, a for you guys who are living in new york uh there was a tv a radio show on plj and the theme song was in Messiah Will Come Again. And as a kid, I was like, what is this? And so that got me into Roy Buchanan, who was just spectacular. Uh, another unfortunate, you know, took his own life, depression and all that stuff. Um, and you played air guitar with all these guys. Sure. Okay, I, I left out David Gilmore being a favorite. Um, jazz guys, Pat Metheny, like I said, John Schofield. Okay, and then people are going to ask of the new guys. Um, no love for the edge. I love the edge. I like you two a lot. I mean, talk about some of the best pop songs. And then, you know, people are like, oh, just the court. So what? He's, you know, if he uses effects, he's, you, you try writing those songs. <laughs> it's my feeling. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just totally great. Uh, what else? Uh, oh, oh, jazz musicians. You know, like, you know, Wes Montgomery, um, George Benson, um, man, uh, I don't love jazz guitar, straight ahead jazz guitar with the clean tone. Um, I love some of the players, but it was never something that I was, that I pursued because I don't love, um, I like playing with some overdrive. That's why I lean towards guys like Scott Henderson when the fusion stuff or Scott or, uh, Schofield or Robin, you know, um, just the rock sensibility on there. Uh, it, 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 people like what? No Joe. I, I, I try to remember all these people. God, there's so many of them. Okay, yeah, Larry Carlton, Michael Landau, absolutely my. Michael Landau is one of my absolute favorites. Uh, Derek Trucks, the guy's amazing, ridiculous. Yeah, there's no, there ain't no shortage of amazing guitar players out there. Of the newer guys, I think Matt Schofield is just ridiculous. I think he, in my mind, is the best younger, whatever that means at this point, blues guitar player. Um, yeah. So I think Matt is totally brilliant. Um, Josh Smith is great. I love Ari you know, Ariel Posen's playing. I 
really love Joey Landris guitar playing. Yeah, the list is endless. And Jim Hall, I'm not leaving anybody yet. Jim, I had dinner with Jim Hall t t twice. Super nice guy. What a great guy. Um, that was a, a drag that he left as well. Um, and the, the funny thing was that the dinner with Jim Hall had nothing to do with my guitar playing. It was, I was teaching somebody in New York and a kid and his parents were friends with the Halls and um, they invited me over. They had set up a dinner so I could hang out and meet him. And so that was pretty cool. Um, he was so nice. What a nice guy. And we didn't even really talk about guitar much. It was just about, you know, stuff. And he was, he was a really great guy. Um, all right. What did Jim Hall order at dinner? It was at the, um, it was at a, uh, at the, at these people's houses. I, I remember I was vegan at the time. I'm vegetarian. I was vegan at the time. And <laughs> his wife was just giving me the hardest time about being a vegan. <laughs> she was well known for being, uh, difficult as far as we know. Um, okay. All right, guys. Thanks so much for hanging out. Um, now we're just getting into the fun stuff of just shooting, shooting the shit about guitar. But I appreciate everyone being here and hanging out. Diminished seventh chord, sharp four diminished. Great place to start. Oh, wait, I left some out. David Grissom. Oh, man, one of my best friends and absolutely one of my favorite guitar players. Uh, he's like, I think he's one of the most badass guitar players ever. And the word badass just fits his guitar playing perfectly for me, right? Like just completely, he's just, I, I think I told this story. I've told him, um, I didn't know who he was. And then the first time I heard him play, I was at the National Guitar Workshop. I was teaching there and he was a guest artist. I didn't know who he was. And then we always played at night with the artist and he played a few chords at soundcheck. And I was like, who is that? What is going on? Like, it was just completely blew my mind what a big sound he had and how thick it was. And I just, and I looked and what he had, he was just playing through some Marshall, somebody's Marshall. And he just had a, a TC overdrive boost pedal, that old one. And that was it. And I'm like, that, that's all he's got. And it really, um, it, uh, it changed my view on guitar playing from that day on. So I told him that, which is kind of fun. He literally changed the direction of how I thought about guitar and guitar tone. Cause at that point I was using uh, rack gear, you know, like a Marshall JMP one with, you know, I could change patches with MIDI. And I get this sound and this sound and blah, 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 blah. And then he had like one pedal and volume and uh, a guitar. And I was like, I don't sound like that. How does he get all his guitar sounds? He's just, he's got that one pedal on the floor that he's only hitting for solos. And I, 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 I figured out at that point in my life that I was doing something wrong, <laughs> very wrong. All right. I'll, I'll stand for another minute on that point too. Like Robin, you know, um, he's got a pedal board, but he doesn't really use it that much. I mean, he's got a little delay just to fill up, fat up the sound, but all of it's his hands. And that was all the things that those, those guys changed in my mind um, that I missed when I was younger that Ingve is basically just a strat, a modified strat into his amp with an overdrive or a boost pedal early on into a cranked Marshall. Willie really Roth, it's cranked Marshall with an overdrive pedal. Eddie Van Halen, cranked Marshall with a boost pedal of some kind. Uh, obviously got all his tricks they did in his amps and things like that. Uh, Michael Landau, you look at his pedal board, has got some pedals. It's basically just an amp and a guitar and an overdrive pedal. So I started realizing that I was doing it wrong, and uh, that's what happened. All right. Yes, people are still naming guitar players. There's millions of them. There's so many great guitar players, and it's such a great time to be a guitar player. Uh, maybe not commercially, but in terms of what the Internet and availability and, and you know, live streams and... and uh, courses and gear and everything like that and and availability uh to all the info all right so thanks guys i will see you next week so please please uh if you pick up my course uh i oh it sounds it's how i make my living true fire is great if you buy it through my website i get 65 percent of that sale which is very generous uh you know because they're doing all the filming and hosting and everything like that so um 25 percent off and uh, some people are like, hey, you know, well, I get the streaming service. Why would I buy it? Because 
If you like what I do, that's a great way to help me out is to buy it directly. Even if you own it, it was like 15 bucks, 20 bucks, something like that. I'm not saying that's nothing, but um, all the guys at True Fire, we see that money directly and we really appreciate it. All right. So uh, thanks so much again to Phil. Thanks to everybody being here. And I'll see you um, next week. Is I think I might take a week. I'll let you know if I'm not going to be here. How's that? I'm, there's some stuff coming together. Uh, me and Jason Locken are going to go hiking. So, all right. Thanks, everyone. I will see you most likely next week. If not, after that. Everybody take care, all right? See you soon.